for today's session and the last session of the day, I'm joined by two very um, accredited and interesting um, people from AWS who are willing to lend their time. And, and we're very grateful for this. Uh, both James and Sarah have, a, a, you'll see they have a wealth of experience and um, we're really great to have them here. Sarah um, is a senior AI and ML specialist for the AI services portfolio at AWS. Uh, she leads the global go-to-market strategy and business development for Amazon Personalize, which enables customers to leverage the same ML technology used at amazon.com to build real-time recommendation models. Uh, prior to AWS, Sarah was the head of sales at Onera, a venture-backed software startup that leverage, uh, leverages uh, machine learning across the enterprise supply chain for global retailers, retailers and, uh, and brands. Sarah holds a degree from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, and Ohio University. She serves as the North Texas Council of Girl Start, a nonprofit that offers hands-on STEM education programs uh, for girls in the area. And James, James Jory is a solutions architect in applied AI with AWS. Uh, he has a background in e-commerce, marketing technology, and customer data analytics. He's held multiple CTO positions and specialize in ar specializes in architecting, building, and leading the development of scalable cloud-based platforms with an emphasis on AI and ML, also data storage, stream processing, uh, search and API driven applications. So he's built and managed several high performing engineering teams across multiple industries, and he has a special interest in personalization and recommender systems. So you're in good company. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you, James, for taking the time. I'm sure if anybody has any questions, you can ask in the chat. And James and Sarah, if you want to take um, a couple of pauses throughout, that might be a good opportunity to, uh, to address some of those questions. But either way, I'll be here as well. And um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining. I will turn the mic over to James and Sarah. Thanks, Dave. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today's breakout session on personalization and retail, leveraging machine learning recommendation models to improve customer engagement. Um, as Dave said, I'm Sarah Strobar. I'm a senior AIML specialist for the Applied AI portfolio at AWS. And my colleague is James Jory. He's a principal solutions architect for Applied AI as well, focused on Amazon Personalize. Both of us work within retail and e-commerce. So for today's session, we're gonna introduce the dynamics driving personalization in retail and e-commerce. We'll dive deep into Amazon Personalize and the machine learning algorithms powering it. And we'll finish with a demo of a live online shopping experience. So we'd really like to keep this interactive. So please do place your questions in the chat and keep an eye out for useful resources and links. We'll drop into the chat throughout the talk uh, and we will try to bake in a few pauses so that we can answer Q&A throughout the presentation as well. So to kick things off, the first thing we wanted to touch on was the current landscape of personalization in general. Personalization is everywhere. It's something that we've all experienced. You've probably recently watched on-demand video. You've seen personalized TV show and movie recommendations that are tailored just for you, or you've visited an e-commerce website and you've seen product recommendations based on your, your past purchasing history. So customers today expect this kind of frictionless curated experience across digital channels as they're going through and considering purchasing and using products and services. In fact, 63% of customers see this as the standard level of service. And when personalization is done well and customers are presented with relevant recommendations at the right time, they're 110% more likely to add items to their cart and 40% more likely to spend more than they had planned. We're seeing market leaders in retail make investments then into enhanced personalization to meet these growing customer expectations and drive a better online shopping experience. This is where Amazon Personalize comes in. It starts with Amazon's rich history and experience in this space. So Amazon.com is a pioneer in personalization with over 20 years of experience. From the first feature launched for recommendations back in 1998 until now, we've learned that different personalization strategies are needed for different use cases. And we've tackled complex recommendation scenarios. Machine learning has enabled us to deliver unique experiences to individual customers based on their behavior and preferences rather than generic segments of people. And our goal is to enable other organizations to leverage our learnings and make it easy for them to use ML with the data and systems they already have to create personalized user experiences faster. So bringing this back to the topic of personalization, most businesses start with a rule-based personalization system. 
Evergage found that 63% of businesses implemented personalization using rule-based methods based on segments, and only 22% were using more advanced one-to-one -one targeting strategies. These systems make intuitive sense, but they get really hard to manage as the number of users increases and the number of items in the catalog increases. It just becomes difficult to define rules that are specific enough to user segments to offer meaningful levels of personalization. Broad rules just don't really do personalization well. Even as the human effort on this increases proportionally with scale, the performance doesn't keep up. And we know this because we've tried it at Amazon. In almost all experiments, machine learning based personalization really does do better than human curated ones. Um, so machine learning does work better, but it's not straightforward. And there are several challenges ex that exist. First, the recommendation system should respond to the changing intent of a user in real time rather than pre-computed recommendations. And it should also handle cold start users or new users and new items or new products. Cold start users and new items, um, that can be easy for uh, a rules-based system, but it's not that easy for a machine learning-based system. Secondly, recommendations shouldn't fall into the popularity trap, uh, where it's easy to build a naive model which recommends mostly just popular items, but it can be very difficult to build one that shows relevant recommendations from non-popular items. Third, unlike some other applications of ML, there's no master algorithm to solve all the sub-problems in personalization. And lastly, personalization is, in a lot of ways, ML 101, but good personalization is really hard. We found that ML experts are needed for building good models, uh, especially models that are accurate and effective. So this combination of challenges means that most businesses stick to rule-based personalization or just don't do personalization at all. But we all know that ML-based personalization generates these highly relevant, hyper-personalized shopping experiences that customers love. So that's why we created Amazon Personalize, which we'll dive into in more detail here in a bit. And it really enables developers to build applications with the same ML technology used by Amazon.com for real-time personalized recommendations with no ML experience required. And it's designed to improve business metrics like click-through rate or conversion or marketing efficiency or revenue. But given that, what are the most common use cases we are seeing at AWS from retail and e-commerce customers when it comes to personalization? One of the most common use cases we see is the ability to deliver unique homepage experiences by personalizing the user's homepage with product recommendations based on their individual shopping history. Another common use case we see is refining product recommendations by recommending similar items, often on product detail pages, to help users easily find what they're looking for. And this maps to discoverability, which is a common business, strategic business priority of retailers today. Another important driver we're seeing for personalization within retail, especially for retailers with large or fast changing assortments, is a need to improve that discoverability by making it easier for users to find new products, deals, or promotions that are relevant to them. We also see a lot of retailers requiring relevant product rankings where you can easily re-rank and personalize product recommendations or search results based on user history personalized for that user rather than just keywords or popularity. And lastly, another common use case that we see in this segment is enhancing marketing communication by personalizing push notifications and marketing emails with individualized product recommendations, often paired with boosting upsell and cross-sell. One example of this is AWS customer StockX, which is a startup based out of Detroit that's revolutionizing e-commerce with a unique bid-ask marketplace model for uh, accessories and apparel and shoes. They added a recommended for you product row to their homepage using Amazon Personalize, and it ultimately became the top performing, performing homepage row and increased customer engagement by 50%. So pretty impressive results. Thanks, Sarah. Let's now take a closer look at Amazon Personalize and see how it works. We'll start at a high level and then go into more detail on the internal concepts and algorithms used in the service, as well as look at some of the core use cases and key features of the service. So you start by providing data about your users and items to personalize. The data we use for modeling in Personalize is of three distinct types. First is the activity of your users, also known as events or behavioral interaction data. Examples include items your users are clicking on, browsing, adding to their cart, or purchasing in a retail scenario. Um, in a video on demand scenario, it could be watching videos, favoriting, or adding to their watch list. 
Now this data set type is the strong, provides the strongest signal for our machine learning algorithms and is the only mandatory data set type to use personalized. The second kind of data set is item metadata. And this includes details about your items. So for retail, this would be product information such as price point, category, size, color, style, brand, essentially the information you already have in your item catalog. Now this data set is optional, but it's very useful for scenarios such as cold starting recommendations for new items, where you wanna make recommendations for items you don't have any behavioral data to draw upon. The third data set type is metadata about your users. So this can include details such as demographics or location. So think of age or gender here. Once you have the data in your service, you can in just a few clicks, get a custom private personalization model trained and hosted for you right within the service. Once that, um, that API is provisioned for you, you can then pull recommendations out of the service and present them to your users um, through your own private API. From a machine learning standpoint, behind the scenes, Amazon Personalize performs all the steps you typically find in a machine learning pipeline. These include processing and inspecting your data, identifying what features in your data are most meaningful to the algorithm, selecting the right algorithms and parameters, training and optimizing a machine learning model, and then finally providing a real-time auto-scaling API. So let's dive a little deeper into how this typically works with customers building integrations with Personalize and introduce some of the other key features of the service. We'll start with those three data set types I mentioned earlier that are inside the service. These are organized into what's called a data set group and Personalize. Most customers typically have other systems in place or solutions that match or analog with each of these data set types. For example, maybe you have a clickstream analytics or event streaming solution, or a catalog management system, and even a user management system. These could be microservices that, that your application uses and underlying databases that support each of these services. Data from these services can be imported into Personalize using a bulk import API, where data is exported from these systems to an Amazon S3 bucket, and then import jobs can be used to import that data into the corresponding data set. Personalize also supports streaming these events directly in, or these data types directly into the service. As we'll see shortly, the streaming APIs work in tandem with Personalize's ability to adapt recommendations in real time and cold start new users and new items. In practice, customers can use either the bulk or real-time or a combination of the two approaches, depending on their architecture, um, the type of use cases they're looking to build with the, with the service and um, their data availability. Once data is imported or is streamed into the service, a solution can be created that combines a personalized algorithm, also known as a recipe, with the, the customer's data. Personalize has three primary recipes that are purpose-built for three distinct personalization use cases, and we'll explore each one of these in the following slides. Once a solution has been created, a model is trained by creating what's called a solution version. Over time, additional versions are created as the model is continually retrained. Internally, Personalize will split the interactions data set into training and evaluation portions and then provide offline metrics that, you can, that can be used to evaluate the model's performance against the held out data. Now that a model has been trained, it's time to get recommendations out of the service. And there are two approaches to, um, to getting recommendations. The first is real-time recommendations where you can create what's called a campaign, which is that auto-scaling private API that we saw earlier. Once you have a campaign, you can provide recommendations in a transactional way to your applications or even to personalize email messages. What we found after we released Personalize is, is that a lot of customers were post-processing recommendations from the service to, do, to apply some sort of business logic or filtering. So we built a feature into Personalize called Filters that allows you to define your own business rules in the service, and then the service will apply those rules directly to the recommendations before returning them to your, to your client. We'll take a closer look at, at what filters do and how they can be used here in a moment. Now, real-time recommendations is not the only way you can get inference out of the service. We also support the ability to create batch inference jobs where you create an input file that lists all the users or items for which you want recommendations. A batch job will run against a solution version 
and then output those recommendations to an output file back in Amazon S3. You can also apply filters as part of your batch inference jobs. Where we see batch recommendations commonly used is with other downstream batch processes, such as caching recommendations and some sort of cache storage, or even to send bulk email marketing. Uh, we see batch recommendations used as input into those jobs as well. So I mentioned the three core use cases supported by the three recipes in the prior slide. Let's take a closer look at each of those. And we'll start with the real-time user personalization use case. So what we're looking at here is a screenshot of the demo application that I'll show you here live in a few minutes. But uh, what this is demonstrating is that when a new user visits your site, um, there's no historical behavior to draw upon, so that which we can base recommendations. And so we refer to these users as cold users. And personalized rec personalizing recommendations for cold users is a particularly difficult problem for machine learning approaches to overcome. However, personalized supports handling cold users out of the box by allowing you to stream interactions or events to personalize in real time. So at the start, personalized will recommend popular products to cold users. However, after you stream an event or two to personalize, the service will immediately start adjusting recommendations based on the user's interest. Recommendations will continue to become more and more relevant as more events are streamed to the service and new items will be introduced automatically based on product metadata. The recipe behind this use case is called AWS user personalization. It leverages a hybrid approach of using a state-of-the-art recurrent neural network to recommend items based on relevance against an exploration layer that uses a contextual bandits algorithm to recommend items that have little to no interaction history. You can control how personalized weighs exploration through the exploration weight inference hyperparameter. This is a value between zero and 1.0, where zero means no exploration, and 1.0 is the most heavily weighted mix of exploring cold items. More heavily weighing exploration is ideal when you have, say, a fast-moving catalog, and a lower exploration is a good match for use cases where you always want to recommend the most relevant items. Taking a closer look at the exploitation side of the recipe that drives the recommendations based on relevance, we use a recurrent neural network our algorithm here that uses sequence models which build upon the insight that the evolution of historical interest and disinterest is a good indicator, indicator of future preferences. So these algorithms have been applied to fields of language processing for some time, but far fewer production systems using RNNs for the problem of personalization are seen in the field. To show this pictorially, we have a user who has clicked on a shoe and then with some delay has clicked on some watches as part of the catalog. So the intuitive recommendation here would be to recommend a watch and not a shoe as the next item that this user would be interested in. We use RNN to capture such sequence patterns in the user's behavior. The order and timing of user interactions is also important and we're able to capture it within the sequence model used in this algorithm. We then combine this with other information about the user such as their location or age leading to a learned user representation. Finally, a dot product with the item vector gives us the recommendation score for a user item pair. The recommendations for a user are then the items with the highest recommendation score. Typical approaches with say matrix, matrix factorization do not have a way to incorporate the sequence of events. When customers go from a traditional offline recommendation system or a traditional collaborative filtering approach, to this online real-time recommendations, they see significant lift and conversions from these type of recommendation systems. The next core use case is recommending similar items. So given an item, recommend similar items based on all other user behavior where users have also interacted with this current item. For e-commerce sites, this is typically implemented on the product detail page but it can also be used to model on purchase data to create cross-sale user experiences for items that are frequently bought together. This uses the SIMS recipe in Personalize for similar item recommendations. And the SIMS approach has been the workhorse algorithm on amazon.com for many years. So SIMS is essentially an item to item collaborative filtering approach. We start by looking at an item 
and find users who had purchased that item. In this case, this is a donut. And when we find that, when we find other items that these users have purchased, we use this to calculate a similarity score for an item to item pair using the number of item times that this item was bought, the number of times the other item was bought and the number of times they were bought together. This algorithm is particularly effective at scaling as the number of items and users increase. However, choosing a, which particular items to display among all items that were bought together is still a complex and challenging problem. The Sims recipe encodes the lessons learned using Sims on amazon.com to solve these problems. The final use case is personalized ranking. And this is where you have a list of items and you want to personalize the order of those items for each user. We see this most commonly used on category landing pages in retail use cases, or combined with a search engine to personalize search results before displaying them to your users. Really anywhere you have a list of products, you can use personalized ranking to personalize your order. This recipe also uses the same HRNN algorithm we saw earlier for the user personalization recipe. The last topic I'd like to touch on before switching over to the demo is the is, is filters in Personalize. Filters can be used to apply business rules to any of the core use cases we've already reviewed. They are ideal for implementing sub-use cases throughout your site, such as the cross-sale example I used earlier. Filters can be used to include or exclude products from being recommended based on criteria that you define. And the syntax, as we'll see in the console here in a few minutes, is looks a lot like a SQL where clause, if you're familiar with writing database queries. Some examples of including products are recommending products the user has purchased in the past to buy again. So this is great if your catalog has items that your customers frequently repurchase over time. Another example is limiting recommendations to products, say, to a specific brand or manufacturer or limiting products that are above a certain rating or score, or including products within a particular category or style. The opposite is some examples of where you would exclude products is not recommending products that are out of stock, excluding products that the user has already purchased, excluding products outside of a particular price range, or maybe you wanna exclude products that are not available based on the user's current membership tier in your application. This feature came from uh, customer requests, both in retail and in other industries where customers were asking us for the ability to filter recommendations by user, item, or event data. So to summarize, there are several key features of Personalize that are relevant to retail and help enable the use cases that we saw earlier. Modeling on impression data allows you to leverage items that are seen but not clicked to drive more relevant recommendations. Item exploration, where you can balance how much to explore, that is where items with less interaction data or relevance are recommended more frequently against how much to exploit, where recommendations are based on what we know about a user's interest. Filtering allows you to include or exclude items to recommend based on business rules that you define. And then cold starting allows you to make recommendations for new users or new items without any interaction history. This is especially critical in situations where you have a fast changing catalog or a rapidly growing user base. So now I'd like to switch over to a quick demo of a live site that implements several of the examples and use cases that we saw here. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a deployment of a retail demo store. This is a sample e-commerce application that comes preloaded with a catalog of about 2,400 products across 17 categories, as well as about 6,000 fictitious shoppers. And we use what we call a persona on each shopper that's identified by three categories in succession that indicates this user's interest in products in these categories. And we use those categories to generate historical interactions that are used to train a model and personalize or multiple models and for that matter, for which we then make use to get recommendations throughout the site. So um, in this particular case, let's look up, let's look on the switch over to the AWS console 
for the AWS account that's powering recommendations behind the scenes for this particular deployment. And this is the personalized console where we see uh, the data sets that it brought in. So if you recall from the, uh, the presentation, there were three different data set types, which we have imported all three here for this particular, um, this particular demo. And then under solutions and recipes, this is where we've trained the three models for the three core use cases. Inside of each of these models, we have the solution versions that I mentioned where the model is actually trained. And then for each solution version, you have the offline metrics as well as um, auto-tuned hyperparameters. You can have personalized automatically determine the hyperparameter values that are best, that best, best match the algorithm and your data set. And then we also have the campaigns, which are the real-time auto-scaling API endpoints. And if we look at the product personalization, we can see that this one has the um, personalization API that you can test your campaigns right within the console. So you can enter a user ID and get recommendations right from the campaign here in the, in the console. So I'm gonna switch over to the storefront and show you how these particular campaigns are being put to use. So on the home page here, we have inspired by your shopping trends, and this uses the user personalization recipe to recommend products based on this shopper's interests. So Robert is 28 years old and he's primarily interested in electronics, then somewhat in outdoors and to a lesser degree footwear. And so we're seeing products recommended in the inspired by your shopping trends that would ma that match Robert's persona. The second use case is the personalized ranking. And so we see that implemented here in featured products. And so this carousel is populated by products that are marked in the database as featured. So it's just a simple flag in a DynamoDB table that indicates which products are featured. We send those products then to the personalized ranking campaign to re-rank them based on, in this case, Robert's interest. So we can see that a product from the electronics category, outdoors are sorted to the front of the list, and then products from other categories are further down the list. So for each user, these featured products will sort differently. Then the third use case is similar item recommendations, and that's on the product detail page. So we can see here that uh, for this particular camera, we're seeing other products that users have interacted with that also interacted with this camera. The personalized ranking use case is also implemented in the search box. And so we can put in a search query here and um, it will search the, a, um, an Elasticsearch index and send those results back to the personalized ranking to re-rank them based on the current user. So if I switch to another shopper that has interests other than electronics, we'll see how the recommendations will change. So let's pick um, say jewelry here as the primary. Sometimes the customers get all taken from a category. So I'll ch I chose um, primary is apparel followed by footwear and accessories. So let's emulate this shopper, Timothy Todd. So when we go to the storefront, we see that the recommended products for Timothy are completely different and they match um, Timothy's primary interest of apparel. There's also some footwear recommendations in here. And uh, here's, a, here's an accessory, a watch. Going further down to featured products, we see now that the featured products are also sorted differently where we have this clothing product here uh, recommended at the front of the list. And then on, product, on the product detail page using SIMS, these are similar item recommendations, again, based on all user behavior. The last um, or the next feature I'd like to demonstrate is the filters capability. So to demonstrate that, I'm going to um, add this um, product to the shopping cart. And I'll simulate purchasing this, this red jacket by going through checkout. Again, this is all fictitious, so uh, we don't prompt for any billing information. And what's happened here, uh, by when I, I submitted this order, an order completed event is streamed back to Personalize uh, in real time. And then that event is captured in a filter, which we see here is the purchased 
product exclusion filter. So the syntax is exclude items where the interactions data set for this user has an order completed event for any match products. Going back to the storefront, we'll see that that red jacket is no longer included in the, in the, the feature products for this particular user, indicating it was excluded because he recently purchased that product. The next um, use case I'd like to uh, demonstrate is the cold user recommendations. So I just opened an incognito window that uh, is simulating uh, hitting this site as a brand new user, cold user, not signed in. And so when you initially come to the retail demo store, you get this splash screen that introduces you to what this, this demo um, solution is. I'm gonna go ahead and skip logging in and go right to and skip the uh, tutorial and go right to the storefront as a cold anonymous user. And so this experience is where you receive recommendations of popular products in the absence of knowing who you are and having any interaction history. So these are just prop popular products. And again, a, a default ordering here on featured products. Let's say I'm interested in um, musical instruments. So I'll click on that trumpet this guitar, this keyboard. And so what's happening each time I look at one of these products, a product viewed event is being streamed back to an event tracker and personalized for this, um, this particular user session. Now, when I go back to the storefront, I'll see that my recommendations are no longer um, uh, popular products, but it's inspired by your shopping trends because personalized now has enough information to start personalizing recommendations for this anonymous uh, visitor. And sure enough, you see musical instruments are being recommended here towards the front. The more I click through the site, the more personalized these recommendations will become. So with that, I think we can turn it over to um, see if there's any questions. Sarah, have there been any questions um, that have come, come no, through? No, no, no questions just yet, but I've included a few links to relevant content based on what you were sharing in the chat. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to either um, verbally share those uh, or put them in the chat. Or if you have a request for diving deeper into any of the, the content or the documentation, please let us know. So we can, um, we can go further into the console experience um, here in Personalize to take a closer look um, since, we, uh, since we have a little bit of time here um, and look closer at the data sets as well as um, the solutions and the campaigns. And so I mentioned in the presentation that the interactions data set is the only required data set for the service. And so if we look at how data sets are set up and um, populated in the service, you create a data set and you associate what's called a, uh, what we call a schema with that data set. And if you're familiar with the Avro um, uh, syntax, this is essentially a JSON Avro schema that defines what columns are in this particular data set. Uh, personalized data sets are imported. The bulk import is in a CSV format. And so this maps to the columns that personalized will find in, in that CSV. Uh, the only required columns in this data set are item ID, user ID, and timestamp. And that's what allows Personalize to do um, to create those sequence models that I mentioned earlier. You can also include an event type. And so when I mentioned from the retail demo store, we were streaming an order completed, a product viewed, add to cart events. Those are the event types that come into the interactions data set. This particular schema also has an additional metadata field called discount, which is used to track a user's propensity to interact with discounted products. And this uses what we call contextual recommendations, where uh, this is metadata that's specific to the context of the interaction. So when you think about a user's metadata, um, their, their age is more static. It's not something that changes from interaction to interaction but the device that the user is using is, is something that will change from interaction to interaction. So I may be using my mobile phone um, uh, uh, while I'm commuting. And then when I get home, I'll be using my desktop 
um, or my laptop as, as a device. Hey, James, before you go yeah. on, just wanted to share one question that came in. And then I think this is useful, so we should we should definitely continue with the demo as well. Uh, but Nigel had a question regarding, does Amazon Personalize only relate to recommendations or can it be used to determine what product information is, is displayed to users? You can, um, you can use Personalize to, uh, to help inform recommending certain attributes of your items. So for instance, uh, Netflix has popularized uh, even personalizing the cover art of videos and movies by based on behavior. And so you could use personalized to model against those different uh, and learn from how users are interacting with different um, maybe product descriptions or um, images or other content or metadata around your product. Um, absolutely. We see those as, as, as more advanced use cases of personalization and using personalized. Uh, most customers are starting with just recommending the items themselves, but there's, there's lots of ways. Personalized is industry agnostic, so it's not built for e-commerce only or for retail only. We see it used across a number of industries where really all you need is um, items and behavior of user, how users interact with those items. And you want to make recommendations of those items based on user behavior. Okay, so, one more, one more, a couple more questions, if you don't mind, just yep. we'll go through these first. Um, another question, is there any limit in number of models and how, the, how does this service manage the models in ML ops concept? Good question. So there, there, there are um, limits to the service and, and some of those are, um, can be adjusted based on, based on use case. Um, and some, some of those limits can be adjusted right within the AWS console. But I'll, I'll kind of start for um, here in, in the console at the data set group level. And so um, you can have multiple data set groups. You can see I only have one in this AWS account for the retail demo store, but I could create multiple data set groups. So you could, you could use data set groups as um, a form of tenant isolation. If you were doing a SaaS based uh, multi-tenant type of architecture, we have some customers and partners that use personalize in, in that way. Uh, you can also use separate data set groups if you want to model on completely different data or different orientations of your data set. Um, the, you can, so you can, you can group those data sets into different data set groups. Now within the data set group, you can create solutions off of your data sets. And these are the combination of the recipe and your data set to train a solution. You can create um, several solutions. You can have up to 20 being trained at any one time. And uh, the limits then, um, you, can, you can have as many solutions and solution versions um, and campaigns for those as you need. The campaigns are limited by default um, to five, but that, again, that can be increased as well. So we will oftentimes see customers creating campaigns that are specific to use cases like I've done here in the retail demo store. Um, but you can create uh, with combined with filters, you can create lots of different sub use cases. So I'm um, not sure if that if that covers the question, but but there there's ways of um, supporting lots of different use cases and sub use cases through multiple combinations of uh, models and filters and campaigns. Thank uh, you, James, yeah. Sarah. Oh, I just ahead. had one quick question here, and it was I guess it's more on the the business strategy side. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to the ideal demographic or maybe the range of demographic for let's say an, a, a, a small or e-commerce platform or store. So if, if there's say, for example, I guess on the smaller end, a small mom and pop shop and maybe they have one person doing their IT <laughs> um, versus somebody who are a larger, maybe they, thousands of people on your site a day, something like that. What would be the pocket in which you, you feel this is most effective? And, and is there a range in which this may not be the best option? So James, I'm sure you, you probably have a perspective on that. Um, from a go-to-market standpoint, we see customers of all sizes using personalized from uh, smaller pure play e-commerce and marketplaces. Uh, up to omni-channel retail, uh, more traditional retailers that have a brick and mortar presence, but also a digital presence in the e-commerce website. Um, and, then, and then certainly large multi-brand, multinational retailers. 
Um, we do have some partners that facilitate uh, easier integration and faster time to value for uh, certain e-commerce platforms. And um, James may be able to share a little bit there in terms of uh, Shopify and Magento and some of our e-commerce integrations. Yeah, so it it the personalized can scale to handle very large uh, retailers and uh, video streaming services, um, content recommendations. So in the in the news and content space, as well as uh, we've seen it be used quite effectively in the SMB space. And and where that's manifested is through a number of our partner integrations that Sarah mentioned for e-commerce, uh, common e-commerce platforms such as Magento. Shopify and soon uh, WooCommerce through our partnership with WP Engine, and so this allows um, you know uh, customers with less less technically savvy customers who don't understand uh, machine learning at all, they can take advantage of the capabilities of Personalize uh, at in, a, in an SMB, and it's still cost effective for them. Um, they, they get enough value, or um, the TCO makes sense uh, for them to use Personalize even for an SMB. But the key, the key um, to success is is having user activity. So you need um, you need users who are interacting with your items, and and that generates the behavior that personalized models against. Uh, the, the absolute minimums for getting started with a model and personalized are a thousand interactions across twenty five unique users, where those twenty five users have at least two interactions, and that's that's the minimum you need to be able to train a model and personalize. Obviously, having uh, more users and more interactions is going to create a, a more effective model, but but that gives you a sense for how um, how easy it is to get, get started. Hey, James, can you repeat the min the minimums? There was a request in the chat. Sure. the The absolute minimum uh, minimums are a thousand interactions. So those are uh, clicks or add to carts or purchases, and within those one thousand they need to be across at least 25 distinct users. So unique uh, user IDs have to be at least 25. And for those 25 users, you need to have at least two interactions uh, per those 25 users. Okay, we can uh, do uh, continue to explore in the, in the console. If there are any more questions. Uh, so we looked at the interactions data set. I'm going to look at the other two real quick and show you how those are laid out. Uh, it's very similar. You have a schema. So in this case, these are our items. The only required field is an item ID. And then um, in this particular case, we have two metadata fields. You can have up to 50 for items. Uh, we have a category and a style. And you'll note here that categorical um, equals true, which this indicates that you can have multiple category values for each item and style is also categorical. And so Personalize will do all the featureization um, of these um, categorical fields for you. You can also have numeric fields, uh, floating point or integer based fields and Personalize will automatically do um, the bucketization of those values for you when it um, trains the model. And then the last data set is the user's data set. And this data set's pretty simple. It just has a user ID, which is the only required value. In this in the schema, and we have an age, which you can see here is a numeric um, representation, and then gender is categorical, like we saw earlier. So these are the three data sets that are behind the retail demo store. Um, you can also see that we used an import job for each of those three data sets, and so this this shows you the status of those import jobs. An event tracker is the um, gives you the ability to stream events into the service. So when we um, when I mentioned that we were streaming order completed product viewed events, those are sent to an event tracker, and the event tracker collects those events in real time, and it does two things: it persists the events to uh, into, to storage to S3 in inside of Personalize, and it also uses those events to update the real time recommendations in campaigns. So when you saw me demoing that user. Uh, that cold user that was clicking around and product and recommendations were changing in real time, the event tracker is uh, facilitating those changes. We looked at solutions and versions um, and, and recipes a little bit earlier, but um, there's there's three types here uh, with the offline metrics um, that are that give you a sense of how the model performed against the the um, held out data. 
the recipes, you can see there are multiple recipes here listed, but the three core ones that we looked at were user personalization, SIMS, and personalized ranking. The popularity count recipe is not really machine learning. It's, it's, it, um, it does uh, basically counting of interactions to determine what products are most popular. And uh, this can be useful to get a baseline of offline metrics that you can then use to compare against using the other recipe types to see how you're moving your offline metrics in a positive, neutral, or negative direction. And then these HRNN-based recipes are um, legacy recipes that will be phased out of the service. Uh, they were superseded by the user personalization recipe, which um, combines our cold starting capability with bandits, as well as meta automatic metadata um, inclusion, um, as well as the interaction um, sequence modeling that we saw earlier. I uh, covered off um, filters earlier, but you can create filters here based on, you can see there's a um, expression builder that allows you to decide if you wanna include or exclude items. You can pick from your schema what fields are in your um, item schema. And then you can have in or not in operators. It supports and and or, and you can even chain multiple uh, expressions together. Campaigns uh, is the real-time recommendations that we saw earlier, and you can, get, you can get recommendations right out of the console here. We didn't look at batch inference jobs, but this is where you can create and monitor any batch jobs you have with the service. Any other questions, Sarah? Yes, uh, there is. Joel was asking, how do we access the retail ML service? I think meaning personalize. So within the uh, AWS console, so this is, uh, this is the AWS console and the account I'm in here. Um, you can search for personalize and that takes you to um, the, the area that I've been um, exploring here in the dashboard and going through these different resources. So this is the console experience. You can also access Personalize through the um, AWS command line interface, the CLI, um, as well as the language SDKs supported by the service. And so the retail demo store was using this application, was using a number of, um, and you can get to this, this full architecture for the retail demo store is available on GitHub under AWS Samples Retail Demo Store. And here is the architecture that shows you all of the AWS services that um, have been used in this demo application. And it's a great um, uh, example of how you can use different um, languages to access personalized. In this case, the recommendations microservice is written in Python and it accesses the uh, personalized campaigns through Python, Python API calls. This um, project also has a number of hands-on workshops. So when you deploy this in your AWS account using CloudFormation templates, which are listed here in the bottom with the launch stack, uh, we support launching this demo into three regions. Um, you could launch it in others. These are just the ones that we have here on the homepage for the, for the repo. And once you launch this application into your AWS account, you not only get the, the storefront experience that, that I've been demoing, but there's also a number of workshops that will guide you through step-by-step -step how to add personalized to, um, uh, to, your, to your storefront and can actually show you, uh, see that, call, that one's expired. What these look like are, these workshops are loaded in SageMaker. Amazon SageMaker is um, a end-to-end -end machine learning uh, suite of products that allow you to, uh, if you wanna build your own, bring your own algorithms and build your own end-to-end -end machine learning capability on Personalize, but we're using it here to host Jupyter Notebooks. And so when you launch the retail demo store in your account, we give you these workshops in the form of Jupyter Notebooks. And I'll briefly show you what the personalization workshop looks like to give you a flavor for um, what it would be like to step through this workshop. When you deploy the retail demo store, it has no personalization. And so you can go through this workshop to step-by-step -step add personalization to the storefront. And so the, the notebook has a series of instructions as well as code cells that will walk you through step-by-step -step how you would add interact with a personalized SDK and API to add personalization to the storefront. So it starts by 
um, configuring some, some file names, S3 bucket. It goes through, pulls products and users from the microservices that are used as part of this project. Um, it will generate the interactions, the historical interactions based on those personas. And then uh, it will um, configure Amazon Personalize with the schema. So you remember the schemas that we saw on the console? This is how those are set up in a step-by-step -step basis. It'll import those CSVs into Personalize, train the models, create the campaigns, show you how to interact with them all within code. We have a number of other workshops that are related to Personalize, such as there's an experimentation framework that shows you how to do A-B testing, um, interleave, interleaving recommendation um, experiments, multi-arm banded experiments, as well as experimentation with partners, AWS partners, Optimizely and Amplitude. And we have workshops for messaging that show you how to use Personalize with Amazon Pinpoint, which is um, AWS's uh, outbound messaging. So for email, text, and push notifications, um, Pinpoint is a service that will integrate with Personalize so that you can personalize the items included in those outbound messages. Uh, and then there's a workshop with the AWS partner Braze, which is um, a SaaS partner that also does outbound messaging. And then the, la the last uh, workshop I want to call attention to is the one on conversational AI that uses Ada Amazon Lex, which is our chatbot service that works with um, the personalization models trained in the retail demo store to provide personalized product recommendations through a chatbot interface. Hey, James, we had a question from Lou on the link to the workshops. And it maybe what we can share is, yeah, the GitHub or um, mm -hmm. the getting start. I already shared the getting started guide, but and I, and I realize we don't have a external link of the demo store, but is there something that would be useful to share um, for people to use on their own. So the the GitHub repo is is the best place to to get that content, and the workshops are all part of the repo. And so I'm here on GitHub. I'm going to um, load the personalized notebook that I just showed you in SageMaker. I'm I'm viewing it right here in GitHub. So the full source code for the entire project as well as the workshops is right here on GitHub. Perfect. And we also had a question on A/B testing. Um, so maybe we can talk through a little bit about the way we approach that. Sure. So personalized, um, I, I mentioned the offline metrics that the service produces when it trains a model. And uh, those give you good directional sense of the quality of the model. But um, to, really, to really measure the impact of these models against a business metric, such as click-through rate or average order value or revenue per visit, you really need to do online testing. And so we um, guide customers towards doing A-B testing as the most common um, approach. And uh, that needs to be done outside of Personalize. So Personalize doesn't have built-in A-B testing capability. And that's something that um, customers either need to have the ability to do A-B testing in their own architecture or use a partner such as Optimizely which we have a workshop for in the retail demo store to show, show you how you can do that with Personalize. Um, and quite often we see customers wanting to do an A-B test of Personalize against say an existing recommendation system or some sort of rule-based um, experience or maybe no personalization to see how effective Personalize is against whatever that incumbent solution is. Um, and some customers have tried to do back testing against their own held out data uh, and that, that oftentimes produces um, flawed results because that behavior is impacted by the current recommendation system. And so only really after an online test can you get a true representation of how the service will do with your customers um, contributing towards whatever that business metric is you're, you're targeting. Um, Sarah, uh, if you haven't already, there's the blog post on A-B testing. That is a great resource um, that goes into much, much more depth on A-B testing with the service. I did, and I put so many resources in the chat now that <laughs> I'm sure people are trying to scroll up or find things. Um, and maybe what we can do is share some of these uh, with this group, or, or Dave can help us make sure that we get some of these resources out to the attendees. Certainly, we will. Uh, I'll do a little collection of the links that are shared, and um, we'll send the videos back out with. Uh, little summary and some info. Um, it'll just take a little bit of time for that. Of course, that would be great. 
Um, any other questions uh, in terms of, you know, maybe customers that, that have interacted with the service? I know there was one question. I shared a few customer case studies. We prefer to have customers share their experience with the service uh, in their own words and their results in their own words. Um, and so that's why we, we shared a couple of videos, one to Discovery Communications um, for their video on demand Discovery Plus service. So they're using Amazon Personalized for personalized uh, movie and, and video recommendations, um, which is a common use case we see in media and entertainment uh, for direct to consumer use cases. And then I also shared a retail one. There's certainly many others on the Amazon Personalized website, um, but that's a good one because they walk through their prior methodology uh, and how uh, by implementing machine learning personalization, they were able to drive results. And then they talk through how they ran A-B testing uh, and what uh, business KPIs they evaluated. One question that hasn't come up yet is pricing is uh, how the service is priced. So it uh, might be worth taking a minute or two just to, to go over how pricing works with the service. So there are three pricing dimensions with the service. Uh, if I go over back over to the console for personalize, it's a, it's a good way to visualize um, how, that, uh, how pricing works out. So the first dimension of pricing is the amount of data that uh, is ingested into the service. And so this um, first sort of stage of getting your data into the service, either importing it or streaming it into the service, there is a uh, per gigabyte charge uh, for that data. The da this part of pricing is typically the most nominal of the other two dimensions. So, um, but there is a charge for how much data is actually uh, resides in the service. The Next dimension is over here in creating solutions, which is actual model training. And um, that cost is based on the training hours to train the models. So you're only charged based on um, the actual time it takes to train your models. That's usually the second most significant um, part of uh, the cost for the service. And then the third dimension is inference. And um, as, we, as we saw, there's two ways to get recommendations out of the service. One is launching a campaign. And campaigns, you uh, when you create a campaign, you specify what we call a minimum provision TPS. And I'll show you here um, on one of the campaigns what that looks like. So you can see minimum provision TPS is a value of one for this campaign. And that is the transactions per second at a baseline that you expect to send to the service. So um, since Personalize will auto scale these campaigns, the guidance is to set the lowest possible value for the minimum provision TPS, which is one, and then let the service auto scale based on your actual traffic. But you can set a higher minimum provision TPS and you're charged on the TPS, either the, the, the higher value of either the minimum provision value or the actual TPS on five minute increments. So again, you pay, you pay for what you use, but you have to pay for the minimum provision TPS. So you can think of a campaign uh, similar to like an EC2 instance, a compute instance, where if you spin it up, but you're not using it, you're still paying for that instance. And so you want to, um, you want to uh, maximize the use of that campaign against actual transactions. The other part of inference is batch recommendations jobs. And those are billed based on the number of items in the input file for the batch job. So those are the three, the three parameters. The one that typically customers um, have the closest look at is the campaigns because those have uh, sort of 24 seven ongoing costs. As long as you have a campaign that's active, you're gonna be paying at least a minimum amount for the, the minimum pr provision TPS value. Okay, it doesn't look like any other questions so far. Oh, never mind. spoke too soon. Sorry, my interwebs is having some latency. Um, Justin asked, is there any way to condition recommendations and personalize based on time of day, day of week, week of year, et cetera? For instance, for products such as food that will be immediately consumed where time of day may provide information on what might be most beneficial to recommend. Yeah, that's a, a, a great example of contextual recommendations. And so here I browse to the interactions data set. And uh, time of day or seasonality is a great example of contextual metadata. So you could add a field to your interactions data set that is maybe day of week, 
or um, time of day where you normalize, uh, say, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If it's for um, uh, for a restaurant that serves um, all meals of the day, um, or if you have, say, a service where your users consume content differently on weekend days than than weekdays, you can uh, include in your historical data a, a seasonality or time of day field. And then when you get recommendations out of the service, you can specify what the current day of week or time of day uh, is when you're getting recommendations and personalized will learn the behavior based on the on that on those contextual fields and make recommendations that are more specific to the current um, seasonality or time of day that you send into the service. So I've showed you here how you would put this in your historical interactions. So when you send these into the service, you would need to take each, each interaction and map that timestamp essentially when this happened to the second to uh, the day of week or time of day, um, the seasonality uh, factor. And then in your campaigns, when you're pulling recommendations out of the service, you can specify context. So imagine we had a feel for day of week and this would be, you know, like Wednesday would be the value. So if I had historical data that had day of week, then um, personalized would learn on those, um, those patterns. And then when I get recommendations, I specify the current day a week, and then Personalize is able to associate that the, the current request to the learned behavior. And, and to add to that, an, another common example of context where, especially in retail and e-commerce, where customers are, are using that feature is device type. So, you know, phone, tablet, desktop. And there was there was actually a study by uh, a university in the Netherlands on the effect of device type on buying behavior in e-commerce. Um, and they, they proved through the study that device type has an influence on buying behavior. Um, and people might postpone a buying decision if they're online uh, with a certain device type and the recommendations uh, don't fit their interaction and their customer behavior and their expectations uh, for the device type. So embedding device type context within the data set uh, does allow personalized to learn that pattern and um, it does improve recommendations. And we do have a blog post that goes into great detail on contextual recommendations. It actually uses airline purchasing data uh, based on what you're shopping for. So if you're shopping for say coach or business class or first class, it uses that as context in both the purchasing as well as um, when you're uh, shopping for a ticket. So this goes into um, a lot of detail on, on how you would use that. Here's the cabin type is in the schema you can see here. So I know we are coming up to time, uh, James and Sarah, um, and I want to be respectful of your time. It, it, if anybody has any questions, perhaps we can get those in now. Um, if not, uh, James, Sarah, did you have anything else that you'd like to add? No, I think it was great uh, to to connect with all of you. I wish it was in person, but I appreciate all of your all of you joining and all of your time, especially in our, in our current virtual world. So I hope that this was a good overview uh, and and a good demo of Amazon Personalized through the retail demo store, especially within the context of the industry. Um, if you do have any follow up questions uh, or would like more information or would like somebody at AWS to partner with you or provide guidance or best practices or feedback on a proof of concept uh, or just just in general kind of support um, your your experimentation with personalized or personalized recommendations um, please don't hesitate to reach out to the team um, you know you're, you're welcome to reach out to me personally uh, or you know I'm not gonna not gonna offer up James time <laughs> he's quite in demand <laughs> But, um, but certainly we'd be happy to help point you in the right direction. Uh, the, the service is very easy to use and very easy to get started though. I did include a getting started guide, uh, a link to the full developer documentation. It's very uh, easy to use and, and very fairly fast to stand up and evaluate time to value uh, and impact. So, um, but that being said, if you do need anything, please reach out to the AWS team. If you have an account manager, um, that, that will be your fastest path uh, to getting support. Um, but also please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate it. And thank you, James, um, you both for taking the time. I know it's uh, on different time zones there. So we really appreciate that. I've posted a link for the rest of the sessions tomorrow. We'll have conference sessions, uh, about nine of those, which will range from higher to very technical. 
um, and some very interesting case studies. So if uh, some folks here haven't had a chance to sign up for tomorrow's sessions, I encourage you to do that. And in June, uh, last piece of news, we have our MLOps World Conference. So that's open. And part of that will be the tooling and demo day. So we have some open source, some other tools that will have specialists and contributors um, on deck to answer any questions and uh, show some fun things. So that's free. I encourage everyone to, to join that as well. I'll be collecting the links that were shared by Sarah. Sarah, thank you for being on top of the ball there and, and sharing all those. As I mentioned, we'll be doing some edits to the videos and we'll include those uh, in, as well as the GitHub and everything else, which we'll send. Please uh, give us a week or two for that um, as we collect those and we'll be sending those out. Um, okay, thank you, Sarah. And thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, James. We, we really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you.